So open your Bibles this morning as our topic unfolds. I'm a great believer that Seventh-day Adventism should not lose its distinctiveness. Now that's about as feeble a response as I've heard in years. I'll repeat that again. Especially if you're coming from paradise, you should be excited. These three here should be... (laughs) I'm a great believer that Seventh-day Adventism should not lose its distinctiveness. Because this movement is not a chance movement, you know that. Even if it's looking weak, which it does at times, it doesn't mean that it's an accidental movement. So open your Bibles this morning to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12. Amen. And you've already praised the Lord to me this morning and I am so grateful. She gave me the most beautiful testimony this morning about several little accidents she's had and she was able to get back on her feet and just give God the glory. That's exciting, isn't it? Praise God for that. I don't know how I missed this for many years, but the biblical symbol of the true church, or the root of truth I prefer to call it, is found right here at the beginning of Revelation 12. So in Revelation 12 and and verse uh, 1, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. I can't believe I missed this for so many years that the biblical symbol of the root of truth or the true church as some people like to say the biblical symbol is the sun, moon and stars as a complete symbol not individually the sun individually is a symbol of the righteousness of Christ we know that the moon of course has a special relationship with the sun what is its connection? It reflects the sun. And the stars are a leadership symbol. We know these things. But together, sun, moon and stars represents the root of truth. There's been a root of truth since the beginning. There's also been a root of error. And they've been side by side and competing with one another since the beginning of this earth. But in Revelation 12, this woman, by the way, if you see the symbol sun, moon and stars elsewhere in Revelation, remind yourself that you're looking at the root of truth, the true people of God. So if one of the seven trumpets is directed at the sun, moon and stars, you can be absolutely confident it's a message for our own movement. One of the trumpets is directed at the sun, moon and stars as a complete symbol. So it's a very exciting symbol. But in Revelation chapter 12, this woman, is she a pure woman or is she a harlot woman? She's a pure woman. She's clothed in the sun. She's clothed in the sun. And Jesus is known biblically as the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness. He's the son of righteousness who will arise. And where does the sun arise? In the east. So that's also when you're in Revelation and the term east kicks in, you know it has to do with the rising of the sun himself. Beautiful symbols already kicking in here. But in Revelation chapter 12, this woman, this pure woman, who is contrasted in Revelation by another woman. Slip over into Revelation 17 for a minute. This is your first assignment today, so I can see how much vitality you really have out here. Slip over to Revelation 17, and I'm looking especially at the first five verses, and turn to the person or person sitting next to you, twos or threes is good, and have a little communication Because there's a woman appears here in chapter 5 and I want you to find out where she's coming from. This shouldn't take more than a minute or two. 
If you've got nobody to talk to, quickly relocate yourself so you've got someone to share with, please. Where is the woman in Revelation 17 coming from? That's your question. I want to know her name. Listen carefully. Three things. Listen carefully. I want to know her name, what kind of woman she is, and where she is coming from. Three things to look for. This is too easy for you. (laughs) What's her name? What kind of woman is she? And where does she come from? Three things. All right, let's hear it. Let's have your attention, please. Such a simple question to get you started with. I can't believe I gave you an elementary level question. Oh, look at these three here. Look very willing. Thank you for volunteering for our first... uh, So go ahead and... Give me the name of the woman, please. Let's hear scripture, lest we perish now. And what verse was that? That's in five. Verse 5. The woman is called Babylon the Great. Oh, you've actually asked, answered the second question too, haven't you? <laughs> but it's okay. It's all there in one verse. So go ahead and, and describe the character of this woman for me. She was a harlot. She's a harlot and she's the mother of harlots. Yes, she is. She's the mother of harlots. Okay. What was the third thing I asked about? Oh, where's she from? Oh, look at these two. Art and Joanne are always ready, but this guy raised his hand first, okay? She's sitting on a beast. By the way, the symbol of a woman sitting on a beast. Who's actually allowing themselves to hear that? A woman sitting on a beast. I'm taking a hand on this. A woman sitting on a beast. No, we haven't got it fully yet. You got half of it though, you're halfway there. A woman sitting on a beast. No, but I, the question is a woman sitting on a beast. So don't call out, I'm not taking anyone calling out, there's a hand here. Church and state. Thank you very much. Why are you sitting in the back row? You should be up in the front row, man. That's fantastic. <laughs> Young man here who's seeing it. Church and state. It's a church state. And Babylon was always a church state. We know that from Daniel. Political power, but the priests were extremely influential. By the way, the Babylonian priesthood wore mystical numbers on a patch on their garments. You could total them in any direction, horizontally or diagonally. They always added up to 666. That's the Babylonian priesthood, which we could say much about, but we haven't got time. So here's a woman sitting on a beast. It's a church-state combination. But where's she coming from? That's the big question. Let's take a hand on this. Where's she coming from? Hang on, you've had one slice of the pie. Let's see if we've got any other hands rising. I'm very good at conscripting if we get no hands up. Oh, hallelujah. Okay. I would say she's coming from confusion. No, I want a biblical answer lest I perish. Babylon is... I want it out of the passage. That, that word is not in the passage. The word confusion is not there. Oh, we have a hand over here. I'm not hearing it fully yet. No one's reading me scripture yet. Okay, she's sitting on waters, but back here. Hang on, I've got another hand here. She, this woman is in the wilderness. Coming back to chapter 12, very quickly now, go ahead and see if you can find wilderness in chapter 12. See if you can find wilderness in chapter 12. One minute should do this. Don't call out, please. I don't take calling out. Talk to your partner. Talk to your partner. I've been wanting to go to paradise for a long time, so I'm... (laughs) Coming over here to these three musketeers from paradise. <laughs> Buddies. <laughs> They've got spirit, these three. <laughs> Go ahead. Listen, listen. Verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God. Wow. Are you hearing it? The pure woman fled into the wilderness. And the next time we see her, 
is in Revelation 17. Something happened to this woman. Did you know that only a remnant was left after her years in the wilderness? She fell into apostasy. A remnant remained faithful. There's always been the root of truth, but it hasn't been the majority. Amen. It's fascinating to me to note that the woman in Revelation 12 goes into the wilderness, and in Revelation 17 we see her in the wilderness, and she's now a harlot. This is the apostasy that the church fell into, and a remnant remained faithful. The pure woman was still alive, but she was no longer the majority. You all know that history. So here's your big question this morning. This is the one I've been dying to get you into. This is a really big question. I haven't given you the question yet. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Chapter 12. Thank you, Marlon, for that clarification. <laughs> Chapter 12. I've missed having Marlon around. I've had no one to pick on recently. You know? <laughs> <laughs> In Revelation 12, there are three phases of the woman. It's not just one picture all the way through this chapter. Three phases or three developments in the experience of this woman. There are actually three, another word I could use here is movements. Three movements. Did you know? In 6,000 years, the entire length of the inhabited history of this planet, in 6,000 years, God has only reached down three times and tapped a man on the shoulder and said, follow me and I will make you into a great nation. He's only done it three times. Think of that. Three times in 6,000 years. Has God raised up a movement? Go ahead, this is the big question of the morning. If you get this one, we can move on. Go ahead and identify in the chapter the three movements that God has raised up. They are all associated with this woman, but the different phases of her existence. This is a major challenge now, so make sure you've got someone to speak to so you can communicate. Identify the three movements or the three phases of the woman. It's probably all symbolically described. Welcome. Just oh, aren't you fortunate, huh? And I thought you were up there. Ah, we're just glad you've made it. Praise the Lord. Oh, dear. Okay, well, you're here. Praise God. Praise God. Yes, you need a Bible for this. You'll die otherwise. Move up a chair so this lady is very kind here. She'll look after you. <laughs> By the way, if the person sitting next to you is just refusing to talk to you, please relocate yourself <laughs> so you can have a good discussion. The three, fa or the three movements or the three phases of the woman. But you've got to pluck it out of the chapter. Now think carefully, is there something preceding that? Well, I think he means in vision, you know? He saw it. It wasn't happening on the earth at that time, it was... I know, but it's curious because she's closed with astronomical things, sun yeah, and stars. Yeah. What better place to be than in heaven? You know? And the dragon's tail is casting down the stars of heaven. Yeah. So these are all, well, I mean, the symbolism fits heaven. I'm sure, if you, I'm sure if you saw sun, moon and stars in vision, you'd be thinking heavenly things. You know? If I was on Patmos, I'd be, Patmos, I'd be very heavenly minded. There'd be nothing else to see. <laughs> okay, let's get some feedback, please. Feedback. I'm taking hands this morning, so please don't call out. I'm taking hands. The first, uh, first of all, I want the symbolism. 
Give me the symbolism first of all. Boy, you're quick again here. Okay, I'll let you get the first slice of the pie here. Uh, you're already giving me an interpretation and I'm asking you for symbolism. I say you're already jumping into interpretation. I just want the symbolism. So can you limit yourself for one brief moment just to the symbolism? Listen, listen. The word church is not there, I believe, so be careful how you express this. The woman which was ready to be delivered. Okay, th- Hallelujah. Thank you for this development. Okay. So we have a woman who is pregnant with child. A woman with child. Okay. Ready to be delivered. That's the first symbolic picture. Thank you for that. That's the first symbolic picture. Hallelujah. We have another volunteer. This is too much for me to handle. Yes. I was just wondering, what about this, the symbolism before that of a woman clothed with the sun? Well, that's the same woman. We could have added all that in here, you know. The woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and a a crown of 12 stars is with child. Thank you for that. That's great. The fact that you're seeing the detail, I think, is fantastic. I just didn't write it all up here, but it's good that you understand that is the description. I'm moving into the second symbolic. Is that a hand or a finger? It's a... (laughs) Listen... I'm sorry, no one's hearing you. Could you use your more well-known evangelistic voice? So you didn't find that earlier in the chapter? Read verse 6 as well, eh? because it's already given there in the beginning. Okay, so the woman in the wilderness is our second phase or our second movement. Thank you very much. We have a woman with child... And we have this same woman has delivered the child. I think we'll put that in parenthesis here, that she has delivered the child. And she's fled into the wilderness. And over on this side of the room, I'm looking for the third movement. I have a question. Yeah. Right, right. Is there a reason for that? Revelation, you know, the way it's written by the author, he keeps continually, when he repeats, he expands too. It's a great principle of prophetic interpretation. Things are repeated, and every time they're repeated, there's something additional added. Very good observation, by the way, very good. Wow. If we were dealing with principles, I'd be jumping up and down with excitement now that you've seen this, you know, praise God. (laughs) All right, still on this side of the room, the third. Oh, we have a woman in the wilderness over here, okay. Listen, well, that's still the woman in the wilderness. Hey, don't call out, please. Did you want to go any further? Okay, read that verse to us, would you? Okay, okay. So we've moved beyond the wilderness experience now. Your version says the rest of her offspring... Other versions use a different word there. What is it? The remnant of her seed. So this woman in the wilderness doesn't survive the wilderness all that well. She changes her garments. She's no longer clothed in the sun. Only a remnant now left clothed in the sun. The remnant of her seed. So go ahead very quickly now with your partner. This shouldn't take more than 60 seconds. And give me your little interpretations of these three movements now. Most of you have sat through many evangelistic series. So this should be second nature to you. Except for the third one here, which we're going to be interested in. Okay, quickly talk to your partner and get the three movements identified. Okay, let's have your attention please. Most of you, as I said, have been through numerous evangelistic series. And I believe we've had a pretty good handle on these things in the past, historically. So there should not be a lot of confusion over this, but it'll be interesting to see what comes out. First of all, the woman 
clothed in the sun, the moon under her feet, 12 stars on her head, and she is pregnant with child. And you deserve it because you've been sitting here as long as I can remember yeah. in seminars. <laughs> I think she's Israel because Israel's the one who brings forth Christ. Okay, she, uh, how many of you thought it was Israel? Oh, well, you're in trouble apparently, huh? I agree with you, by the way. You thought it was Israel because Israel brings forth Christ. Yes. And we've never had any problem historically. I wasn't planning to defend all this this morning because that would take longer than we have. But we've seen for a long time now that Israel is the original root of truth. And the man that God called? Abraham. Abraham. God called Abraham. And built out of him, as he promised, a great nation. Abraham is the beginning of what I call the root of truth. The world is in darkness. God taps a man, a shepherd, basically, but the owner of vast flocks taps him on the shoulder and says, get up and move, relocate yourself. It was an act of faith for him to do this. And Abraham responded and God fulfilled his promises to him. The root of truth was clearly established in Israel. We should, by the way, be very respectful of that. But uh, I know when I was in Israel once and I was sitting on a bus next to a Jewish professor who was determined to squeeze me into the wall of the bus, he was so big, and in between gasping for breath, he told me that he was a Jew. I said, well, so am I. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, well, you don't look like a Jew. I said, what, is my nose not big enough? <laughs> he was a professor of Hebrew at Hebrew University, very learned man, spoke Hebrew, Aramaic, among other things, could read the Old Testament in the, in the original languages. So he's looking at me, you're not Jewish. I said, I'm as Jewish as you are. He said, well, what's your basis for making such a claim? I said, Abraham is my father. I said, I apologize for having to quote one of your fellow countrymen by the name of Saul of Tarsus, who was also at least half Jewish. <laughs> I said, I'm forced to quote him, but he said, all those who are believers in Jesus Christ, who also happen to be Jewish, I emphasize this, are children of Abraham and heirs according to the promises. I said, the same promises that you're hanging on to, I am hanging on to. Therefore, I'm claiming the right. It might be a spiritual right, but I am as Jewish as you are. I'm connected to the same root of truth. I was tempted to say it might even be a stronger connection than yours, but I didn't say that. <laughs> and this guy looks at me and he says, yes, he said, but it was Friday afternoon. He said, but I'm hastening to get home because it's going to be Shabbat. Well, I said, well, I've got news for you, buddy. I'm hastening to get to Jerusalem too because it's going to be Shabbat. He said, you mean Sunday? I said, no, I mean Shabbat. He said, you are a Protestant and you worship on Shabbat? I said, I'm unique. <laughs> like a good Jew, I worship on Shabbat. <laughs> he couldn't believe it. He'd never met anyone. Even though we have that church down by the wall of the old city, he'd never heard of Seventh-day Adventism. Wow. So he said to me, would you be, consider an invitation to my home tomorrow afternoon? I said, well, it's Shabbat. He said, yes, but I would like to have a study with you in the word of God. Oh. I said, I will come on one condition. I've got a thick head, you know. <laughs> I will come on one condition. He said, what is it? I said, that I choose what we study. And I said, you can rest assured I'll be choosing something from the Old Testament out of respect for your religion. Oh, he said, you can choose anything you like. But remember, I'll be reading it in the original languages. <laughs> He's challenging me. 
So God convicted me what to say. And I knew this was a book of the Old Testament that the Jews do not study. I said, I would like to have a study with you from the prophet Daniel. He was shocked. He said, well, that's not a book. I said, you said anywhere. I'm holding you to it. I want to study Daniel. That's my condition for coming to your house. I knew I was being greatly privileged to be invited to an Orthodox Jew, Orthodox Jew's home on Sabbath afternoon. So he agreed. He said, do you have a particular chapter in mind? I said, actually, I do. I've got two chapters in mind. Chapter 8 and 9. You know that I'm thinking 2300 days. And this guy agreed to it. It was such an experience for me to spend the whole of Sabbath afternoon. There were no buses, no cars in the Jewish section of Jerusalem. It was quiet. And I knocked on the door and he opened the door. It was very dark inside. There were no lights on. We sat in the living room and I said to him, you know, this is a little dark for me. I noticed there's light on in the kitchen. Could we migrate to the kitchen? He said, okay. And his wife followed us in. There were only two chairs at the table and his wife is left standing. I said to him, you know, I'm a little uncomfortable with your wife standing and we're sitting. I said, it's okay. I said, well, it's not okay for me. That's not the way I was raised, you know. I said, we need to find another chair. Oh, he said, oh, Shabbat. I said, look, I'm a Gentile. I'll go and get the chair, you know. (laughs) So I went and got the chair. We sat down and I started sweating. I said, this is a hot room. And I looked around and there were saucepans on the stove and they're all bubbling away. I couldn't resist. I said, Shabbat. (laughs) And he said, no, we turned the stove on before sunset on Friday. It's on a very low heat and it goes off after sunset on seven. And so I sweated it out in his kitchen with all this heat. And, you know, we had a study on that. I better quit this story because it's too time-consuming. But it was such an incredible experience. This man knew Aramaic. He was able to read the parts of Daniel that I was referring to, which were written in Aramaic. It's the only part of the Old Testament that's not written in Hebrew. And he's reading it in Aramaic. And he knew the history. So he knew the dates associated with the Babylonian captivity The three times that they were set free, he knew all of that. And then we came to that verse in Daniel 9. In the midst of the week, what happened? I have acute hearing, but I'm still not hearing the mumbling out here. The Messiah, thank you, Mello, the Messiah was cut off. And he stopped dead. I said, yes. You've had all the dates right so far. So you know what year is referred to in the midst of the week, don't you? He said, we have to finish the study now. I said, okay. He said, I want to meet you tomorrow morning. I'm going to give you a personal tour of the old walls of Jerusalem and explain all the history to you. But he said, I'll let you know tomorrow morning how I'm understanding the the Messiah being cut off in the middle of the week. I couldn't believe his openness. So I met him outside the royal gate, the one that's all walled up in the walls. And he gave me the history of that gate. And uh, he said, I guess you're wanting an answer. I said, I'm wanting an answer. He said, well, if I accept what you've given me and what I've seen, I would have to accept the fact that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That's what he says. I said... I said, are you that intellectually honest? He said, I'm that intellectually honest. He said, this is the first time I've ever seen this. I said, I understand. He said, and you'll forgive me if I need to take time to digest this. I said, absolutely. But I'm satisfied that you've been honest in hearing the word. What a great experience that was. He moved to Canada and I lost track of him, unfortunately. But I mean, the seed was so seriously planted in his mind. So we've got Israel here, which was the beginning of the root of truth. The woman who fled into the wilderness for 1260 days, 
Let's see a hand on this side. Oh, we've got such a forest of hands here. Look at that, huh? <laughs> Just hang on a minute while I check and see. I thought I brought one of my antidepressants with me. Where are they? Come on, a hand out here. All right, I'm going to have to... Uh, oh, my good friends here from the mountaintop. Well, what, what's the broad term we use for the successor to Israel? In broad terms. Thank you. That's not necessarily early. The 1260 days takes us up into the Middle Ages, you know, and beyond. Excellent work, yes. We're looking at the Christian church. The Christian church. Christianity. And the man that God tapped on the shoulder was one who had illustrious family connections. Marty, I see that look of uh, understanding on your face. I haven't seen that there for a while. This is really encouraging. <laughs> Who did God tap on the shoulder? And we'll let Lou and tell you if you like. Uh, they're like a team, these two. Oh, Helly, Lou, could you shout that out? She does have a more, more formidable voice, but she's reluctant to use it this morning. Okay, it was Jesus himself, the beginning of Christianity. Yes, Jesus. And the third movement, by the way, the third movement had to arise following the end of the 1260 days. Now in prophetic time, that takes us to what year? No, come on, prophetic, 1798. 1798, the end of the, of the 1260 year prophecy. So the third movement had to arise following 1798. In other words, it's a latter day movement. And there's about 20 movements. All began around that time. Hands now for the third one. The Statue of Liberty's already got her hand up. Uh, here's a new hand. This is the Protestant era here in Christianity. This has, includes the Reformation time here. If you're going up to 1798, you've already gone beyond. The Mormon Church has been volunteered. We appreciate that. We'll talk to you later. Yes. Uh, <laughs> And they are Latter-day Saints. <laughs> Come on, anyone else got a suggestion here? Mello? The Advent Movement. And it's interesting that you would say that, the Advent Movement. And the individual that was raised up, tapped by God to begin this movement, this Latter-day Movement? William Miller, thank you very much. Yes, William Miller. William Miller. My mother, when she was here last, wanted to visit William Miller's oh, house. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me, Lord. <laughs> that is a first. <laughs> I cannot believe I did that. <laughs> I was talking about mother and I was thinking <laughs> mother liversids, obviously. <laughs> oh wow, that, that is a, a faux pas of the highest order. <laughs> What's that? Yes. <laughs> I need serious counsel, obviously. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm glad this wasn't being televised. <laughs> My mother wanted to visit William Miller's house and <laughs> land and uh, those stones are there with, that the believers stood on in 1844. So my mother went out on the stones and she raised her hands up like this. She said, Lord, I'm ready, take me now. I said, Mother, be careful, he might answer your prayer. <laughs> By the way, she's 94 and going strong, stronger than ever. Now... The Advent movement has been recommended as being the third of these movements. 
In order for it to qualify there, you would have to see something in common between all three movements. They would have to have something substantial in common to link them together because this was the original root of truth. That root of truth was passed on to the Christian church. Was it in fact passed on to the Advent movement? The only way we'll know is if you go ahead now in a quick discussion and identify for me, we're not ready yet, but I'll come back to you after this discussion. These guys from paradise, there's no holding them back. You know. <laughs> go ahead and identify with your partners what is the common link between these three movements. They have something substantial in common and it's one of the reasons why I became a Seventh-day Adventist was to see this link that God established here, he continued here and has in these last days manifested the same root of truth again. So go ahead, don't sit gazing up into heaven now, have a communication quickly please. What is the common thread? That's what you're doing. Identify the common thread. So these tapeworms here have got it, of course. Oh, well, you're on like third base. So you're not there yet. I'm glad I didn't call on you. I can't believe I wrote that up there. I know. I have never seen That's the first time in history. <laughs> wow. She's getting quite animated here. Yes. Oh, what made you say that? Wow. Wow, that's an excellent insight. I'm coming to you. Oh, you said it. You triggered her. I should have known. <laughs> well, you know this. Or, or did she? Well, I will deal with her later. I gave my opinion. Oh, okay. Oh, good. Okay. Did he hit it on the head? Did he have it? Oh, okay. Okay. You couldn't resist the temptation. <laughs> she chose a good seat, didn't she? Very wisely. <laughs> All right. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. Listen. Now I wouldn't mind getting somebody who did not get input from somebody else. But you actually saw this for yourself. You've made what we would call an original discovery. <laughs> hey buddy, is that an original discovery you've made here? Well, basically from all three, Israel... Turn around a little so they can hear you. Stand up and deliver like Martin Luther, right? <laughs> <laughs> What are you saying? We're all legalists? Or? No, 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 oh, no, okay. no, 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 it's not legalists, but again, it's... Um, all right, it's an excellent insight, and uh, we want you to enjoy standing on third base. It's a very comfortable base, you know? <laughs> it's not a home run, however, but you've done well, man, you've done well. You've given me a partial answer, and I'm looking for the whole enchilada, you know? So, uh, oh, hallelujah, okay... So you've joined hands with our friend here and jumped off the same bridge. Right. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's an excellent observation. I hope you're going to be here all the week because I'll need this comment maybe tomorrow. That's an excellent comment. Did you all hear what she just said? You didn't. Stand up and make it evangelistic, would you? Wow, well, wow. Well. Now, that's an excellent comment, and I'm so happy to hear somebody seeing in the phrase the testimony of Jesus much more than a reference to Ellen White, you know. And this, we're just beginning to open up this door. Thank you very much for that. At the back over here, because that's a pretty common belief. Uh, 
it wouldn't necessarily make the Advent movement unique in any respect because the whole of Protestantism and Catholicism has that belief. This is a unique... But I appreciate where you're going with this and it's a very intelligent observation you've made. But this is something that will definitely bring distinctiveness with it when it comes here and then here. Prophecy. God guiding his people, okay, through the prophets. That's an interesting observation. We would say it's quite profitable, actually. Okay, back here. Listen. I'm not jumping off the bridge with that guy, but I'm going to throw him. Well, he might be willing for this to happen. Listen. Shh, shh. Revelation 12, 17. Okay. Oh. Okay. And it's what those movements have in common we're trying to establish. Now you've kind of jumped to the end of the journey and left the journey out. And if you could just bring the journey into your statement, you'd have a beautiful statement because I love what you're saying. You're actually opening a great door here. But this is something unique that binds these three movements together. You, you've been so faithful, your hand is consistently raised. It must get tired, you know? No, never. Go ahead. <laughs> I think atonement is a big word for the whole thing. Atonement is a beautiful word. And the first all the symbolism would bring us together as being one. All right, it's it's not crowded yet on second base, but it may get more crowded yet. It's an excellent insight you've had, but it's not the whole picture. Once again, like our sister back here, you've given me a partial response, and I'm really looking for the whole this gentleman who's been so patient just sitting there like the three wise uh, well never mind go on God told Abraham to make the great nation that movement but we don't have that in common with the Jews do we even though he came out of that he, the Jews did not have this belief in a Messiah this is a common belief in all three sections it's common to oh to tie her down she might float away and get raptured she's so excited <laughs> listen listen And, and you've done well. You've joined hands here on second base. It's not crowded yet, so... But uh, that's a, it's a good... Co these are all excellent contributions. I'm thinking... Oh, no, hang on. I'm, I'm pointing here. Oh, I'm I haven't come to you yet because you had input. That's why I was yeah, waiting, you know. Um, I think it all ties around movement. We've had a major defender of the law over here. You're going to join hands with him or what? <laughs> I didn't hear you bring it out of the first movement. The, the law was given to Oh, the law was given. Yes. I see, yes. Okay, so enjoy second base. It is starting to get crowded. <laughs> it's starting to get crowded. Listen, listen. Would it be that all three of these uh, movements, all these three of these phases, all of them were being persecuted? Well, that wouldn't be a belief so much as an experience. And I think it's a valid... Because of their beliefs. They certainly had that in common, yes. All oh, right, take two more minutes and talk to your partner again. This is a common belief. Don't wave at me. This is a common belief that's present in all three. Two more minutes to discuss. Don't sit go gazing into heaven or going into vision. Communicate. Expand your thinking a little. Expand your thinking a little. You might just land on it, you guys. Expand your thinking. The law is definitely a part of it, but it's not the whole picture. Same answer. I'm glad you didn't call on me before. Well, I'm glad I didn't drive. Right. <laughs> We'd have to talk about the fall from paradise, otherwise. <laughs> I'm not from paradise. I'm from Sierra. Oh, are you? I'm, I'm out here mingling with them now. <laughs> They're not necessarily claiming you yet, you'll exactly. notice. <laughs> I know. They only invited me to turn my chair. Wonderful. <laughs> Okay. Um, you kept asking about the, um, who was 
the chosen one, or who, what did you call The him? individual that God yeah, tapped on the, that? on the, on so the, we'd have to go back into a biblical history okay, to get but that. It's not from this the call of Abraham is clearly spelled out in the Old Testament in no, Genesis. No, but I mean, where, where does it, where were you, um, why is there one person associated with each movement? Well, there just happened to be that in history, that's okay. all, yeah. Okay. Jesus, there was no Christianity until Jesus came and started saying, follow me, yeah, you know, yeah. okay. that's how it got started. Okay. And William Miller was the voice in the last days, who right. was the first one to raise his voice, that's all, it just happened to be the way it was. Ellen White? Like, Ellen Ellen White came much later than William Miller, okay. yeah, much that's later. Right. What is it? The Advent. That came out with somebody. Did it? Okay. You notice they didn't get the crown of victory. Yeah. We didn't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we decided it's the Advent. The Advent. In other words, the first Advent or the second Advent. That base is getting pretty crowded. I think, I think the we got belief, something different. The oh. common belief in all of those is that God can be trusted. Well, yeah, that's true in, a gen in general terms, but this is a little more concrete than that. But that's good, man. That's good. Because mm -hmm. we won't come to this group. <laughs> I understand there's a oh Stephen has a unique concept well that does not su this does not surprise me at all man he's a unique being this guy well actually I, we want to see what you say about it even though we're probably striking out um, the, the theme the common theme is the, the dragon has something to say about all these people so in Adventist terms we'd call it the great this is a rather positive well that's an interesting no that's, that's actually not a that's not a weak answer at all that's a strong answer it may not be quite the home well, run, sure but, it's, not correct. but <laughs> it's certainly valid, and it's something I would be prepared to accept as second to what's about to come out. You know, now it's excellent answer. I'll take that. Excellent. <laughs> I still think it's the commandments. It's got to be the commandments. Well, and you've joined the crowd over there that are jumping <laughs> off the bridge. How about the Where did you get that from? The whole story is about the sanctuary from, from this Now, to I've given someone else the chance to go first, but if they don't get it, I'm coming to you. Okay, what, what's your first name? Emma. Emma. I want to show William Livers' hand. Emma Livers is the one who has the most faith motif. Uh, wow, yeah, that's a great motif, and that is an essential part of what's about to come out. Yeah, that's a great motif, and essential part of what's about to come out. In fact, it, it probably is another way of saying the right answer that's coming out. So it's an, it's an ex yeah, that's the, that's the essential ingredient of this, you know. Excellent, guys, excellent, wow. Oh, oh. oh well, this is another excellent third base answer. <laughs> Say that again? The oh, well, that's a different matter, isn't it? Wow, that's excellent. Excellent. Now, someone's just beaten you to it. All right, let's have your attention, please. Can we get some sound here? Woo! All right, listen carefully. Emma, we want you to stand up, would you? Quiet Emma sitting back here has seen something very powerful and, and the, the paradisical group has just seen it as well but you beat them to it. You apparently went through the gates ahead of them, you know? No, you weren't here. She said it Emma has seen something beautiful. She's actually hit the nail on the head. So I'm coming to Emma, then to the group at the back because they had a comment which is almost as good as, as Emma's comment. Listen very carefully to this. Use your evangelistic voice, Emma. Shout out to these people in the uttermost parts of the earth over here. She's hit it on the head. It's the sanctuary. Oh, you got it, did you? Oh, it's a miracle, man. Oh. <laughs> Excellent, Emma. Very well done. Thank you. Did you know that this is the only common element, really, between these three? Is the sanctuary message. But the back row there has put an interesting slant. 
on the sanctuary message. This young man, if you would stand up and deliver, would you? Yeah. The other point that we were making is yeah. we should be focusing on. Oh, well, I like the way you said that. Okay. And, and I can't fault your answer. I would have accepted it, actually, had it come out first. Because the sanctuary is actually the plan of redemption, which is the righteousness by faith motif, as you put it so well. Praise the Lord, man. Powerful statement coming through here. The sanctuary. The sanctuary, which is the only teaching in the Bible that demonstrates the complete plan of redemption. I'll repeat that again just in case there are unforced evidences of life out here. (laughs) The sanctuary is the only teaching in the whole Bible that contains the complete plan of redemption. And another way of expressing that is our young friend, what's your first name? Andy. Andy has put so eloquently, another way of expressing that is the righteousness by faith motif, which is another way of saying the whole plan of redemption, which is another way of saying the sanctuary service. Beginning with Israel, the sanctuary was established. Moving into the New Testament, we understand from Hebrews especially that the sanctuary was actually originally in heaven. And what happened on earth was a copy of what was already in existence in heaven. And interestingly enough, the Advent movement is the only movement that I've been able to find in these last days, which was actually established on what great scripture? What was the big text of the early Advent movement? Daniel 8.14 Unto 2,300 days then shall... How many of you in the last 20 years have heard a message on the cleansing of the sanctuary? Well, there's a handful here. I'm running into people who've been sitting in church for 20 or more years and never even heard a sanctuary message. And yet this is our most distinguishing teaching. The Advent movement was raised up by God and commissioned to share the good news as revealed through the sanctuary. (laughs) Maybe they do take vacations in heaven. (laughs) The Advent move, I'm going to keep repeating these things till there are visible signs of life. The Advent movement was raised up to share the good news as contained in the sanctuary message. It's a three-fold message. That's why there are three sections to the sanctuary, the courtyard, the holy place, and the most holy. It's the complete plan of redemption. God was trying to save us from having a message that just led people to be forgiven. That's not the end of the journey. It's an exciting message. So we're going to start looking now because the sanctuary message has a habit of popping up in many different places. I didn't realise how often Paul brought it into his writing. So turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Three verses. Only three little verses And the Apostle Paul has managed to bring in the whole sanctuary service. Turn to your partner very quickly, looking at those three verses, 25, 26 and 27, and see if you can identify the three elements of the good news associated with the sanctuary in those three simple Verses. Quickly have a discussion with your partners. You need to read carefully now to get this out. We 
got lost in the text. <laughs> See if you can identify the three aspects of the sanctuary in these three verses. The three parts of the uh, plan of redemption. Have you talked? Oh, it's a miracle. You're looking very sure back here. This is encouraging. <laughs> if you understand glorification, that'll be good. You know? Glorification is having been made perfect in the image of Christ. So that's a word you're going to have to work on, isn't it? But you've got the sequence. That's good. Very good sequence. So I'm coming to you for the first point. Okay, so be ready. Use verse 25 for me. When I call on you, stand up and read verse 25 and make your first point. Okay, very good work. Very good. Oh, look who's sitting here in all her glory. Hey, Hello. Good to see you. You do. <laughs> They're my new friends. Oh, praise yes. God. Huh? Praise <laughs> God. I'm, I'm glad <laughs> you've taken her there. under your wing. Mm-hmm. Praise the Lord. I'm glad too. <laughs> <laughs> We're just glad you're here. (laughs) We have fun, as you can see. (laughs) The question is to be repeated. Listen carefully. Three verses, the three aspects of the plan of redemption... Or the three aspects of the sanctuary service. Same thing. You can pluck these three things out of those three verses. When you start reading Paul, all of a sudden you realise how sanctuary oriented he is. This is about to come through. I've already got someone who has volunteered the first phase. So let's listen carefully. Stand up and deliver, would you? Read verse 24. What's your first name? Florence, oh excellent Florence, read out verse 25, would you? Husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And the point you were making from that is, what word were you picking up on? No, what word were you picking up on in the verse? He gave himself up. Gave himself up. Florence picked up on the gave himself up. For God so loved the world that he gave and Florence, oh, why are you sitting down? We're not done with you yet. <laughs> You're doing very well, by the way. And you saw a theological word here. What word came through to you? Justification. Say it again because I apologise for the feeble response in the room here. Justification. Oh, see, if you say things two or three times, you get a response. Excellent work, Florence. Justification. Justification. We're going to be developing these words. By the way, the first aspect of the sanctuary was the courtyard. And what took place in the courtyard? The sacrifice, the atoning death of Jesus was symbolized every time a sacrifice was offered in the courtyard of the sanctuary. And through the atoning death of Jesus, of course, we have the beautiful privilege of justification, which is going to come through loud and clear, especially tomorrow morning. We're going to be developing this. We need two sessions a day, not one. Amen. Amen. They do amen some things. <laughs> All right, so the second, the second. Yes, you've earned the right to this, Mallow. Stand up and deliver, would you? Read the verse to us. Read verse 26. So there's cleansing. And the word that's used is? Sanctification. Sanctification. And the cleansing takes place through? The washing by water and? The word. We're going to develop this in the morning. This will come out in detail. Okay. By the way, somebody in a seminar fairly recently made a profound statement. They said that sanctification is the process where God makes you into what he's already declared you to be. 
beautiful statement, beautiful statement. The process where God makes you into what he's already declared you to be. And what has he declared you to be? Righteous in his sight. And anyone who embraces the atoning death of Jesus will be privileged now to receive his marvellous life. So let's get the third section out now. Okay. Stand up and deliver this so the saints can be edified. Turn around and face them all. Verse 27 says, that's glorification. Okay, so we are, but before you sit down, we are wondering if you're familiar, if you are familiar with the book of Ephesians, I'm sure. So can you, and this is asking a great deal, I wouldn't do this if I hadn't seen you in action previously. (laughs) See how confident I am. Can you think of a place earlier in Ephesians where he's actually spelled out, and the word glory and glorification go together. He talks about glory. And the reason I'm asking you this is because there's an old thinking out there that glorification is something to do with us becoming glorified and I'm just wanting you to pick up on Ephesians now especially chapter 3 oh boy how helpful I'm getting eh? Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Ephesians chapter 3 and go ahead and read the last chapter of the verse for us oh the last verse I'm losing it today (laughs) listen church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Any glorification that's taking place is not the glorification of man. It's the glorification of God. I just wanted that. Thank you very much. You've done very well this week. What did you have in here? What, what part of the verse did you pluck out for us here? Well, I looked at a couple of places. And no, in, in verse says, 27. It says glorious church. And then it says, uh, it says, that she should be holy and without blemish. So a holy, without blemish church. And what does God do with this church? Don't put words in her mouth now. Well, he presents her to himself. He presents her to? Himself. Himself. Okay, I'm glad you picked up on that. Well, this is, what's the context of this chapter? What's he talking about in this chapter? The relationship between? A man and his wife. A man and his wife, between husbands and wives. Yes, he is. And in the context of a chapter dealing with husbands and wives, God prepares a holy, unblemished people and presents them to himself. It's almost like a bride coming to the bridegroom, you know? It's a beautiful description here. Wow, look what's come out. Only Paul can put this in three little verses. Now we are, at this moment we must now draw the sanctuary. We have to get it out here. Let's use my incredible artistic skills again. I probably shouldn't have drawn this as though it's part of the building. It's not. This is the courtyard. Courtyard. This is what? Holy place. And this is most holy place. Okay. So go ahead now with your little team that is growing. We've only got a couple of minutes left and put the furnishing in for me. If you can't do this, we're having a class on repentance afterwards. So <laughs> go ahead and put the furnishing in all three places, please. We want to see how well you can do this now. Work as a team now. Work as a team. Good to see you in the flush, man. Yeah. Dane enjoyed his time with you, he said. Oh, 
Apparently he had a pretty vigorous discussion, huh? It was good for him. He enjoyed it immensely. I was grateful. He should be here, but he slept in. <laughs> you know, I just learned about the, uh, in the art of the, the most holy place. Yeah. We've, we've been taught or we've, that in the Ark of the Covenant, there was the Aaron's, uh, Aaron's rod, rod yeah. and the uh, Father Man, but those were never inside the Ark. No. They're outside. Mm -hmm. But inside the Ark was? was only the uh, Ten Commandments. Yes, yes. Bill, have you ever asked an Orthodox Jew the meaning of the sanctuary? What they, what they say about it? Not in detail, no. Because yeah. the whole nation yeah. missed it. I know, I know. And they still miss yeah, it. Yeah, they do. So aren't we rather arrogant as New Testament people going back and explaining to them what their That's own... That's why I studied Daniel with that guy. Yeah. Oh, it was a divine appointment. Powerful time we had together. Powerful. He was convicted. Really convicted. When he got to Canada, he looked for an, a Sabbath-keeping church. He emailed me, but that, I haven't heard any more. So I believe that he may have acted on his faith, you know? Mm -hmm. If anyone has accurately filled in the furniture, I mean accurately, you are free to leave. <laughs> well, we're going to have a discussion on this, but let's. So, what's in the courtyard? A labor and an altar of burnt sacrifice. This is the place of sacrifice. This is the place celebrating the atoning death of Jesus.